Hello everybody and welcome! My name is Lucian G. Kaiser and today we are taking off again into the Macross Variable Fighter lore series by going over the incredibly deadly Anti-UN Forces Variable Fighter, the SV-51. Let's get started! Lucian G. Kaiser and the SV-51 launching! Now, before we begin this episode, I have a few things I need to bring up about the VF-0 series that I missed in the previous video. Along with the overtuned turbofan jet engines, the VF-0 models also have a set of three Shinkansu ARR2 maneuvering rocket motors for use in Jerwalk and Batroid modes. They provide a boost of directional thrust to help with maneuvering the variable fighter in both Jerwalk and Batroid modes, which of course leaves it unable to be used in fighter mode due to their position in that transformed version. So now that we have that out of the way, let's go ahead and take a look at the deadly beast that is the SV-51. Here we have one of the first operational variable fighters to engage in direct combat against the UN forces, the SV-51. The SV-51 was developed in secret as the weapon that would allow the anti-UN forces to dominate any conventional military forces that they might go up against. Like the VF-0 Phoenix, the SV-51 is an advanced trial production model despite being a prototype but unlike the VF-0, it was designed from the beginning for actual combat. Also unique to the SV-51, its design was more focused on creating an advanced tactical fighter while still incorporating the three mode transformation concept of the VF-0 simply as more of an add-on feature instead of a core system mechanic. Due to this, the transformation ability is not as well integrated into the design of the SV-51 as the systems on board the actual variable fighters of the UN forces. The SV-51 is a sleek and deadly fighter, graceful like a bird of prey in the skies, menacing the forces of the United Nations government with lethal tactical combat prowess. The development of the SV-51 series began in 2007 when the nearly defeated anti-UN forces laid plans against the United Nations government even as that United Nations government established themselves as a world power. Using their ties of considerable influence over certain nations, they gathered resources through those connections to begin building up their power base again and initiated plans to gain technological superiority over their enemies. Through espionage, intelligence gathering, and well-planned raids against United Nations government facilities, the anti-United Nations forces managed to gain access to significant amounts of over-technology that was actually being used to develop the United Nations government's military programs. Seeing the prototype schematics for the variable fighter and identifying its potential, the anti-United Nations group developed their own variable fighter, which they designated the SV-51. The SV-51 was jointly developed by Sukhoi, Israel Aircraft Industries, and Dornier. Most intelligence suggests the involvement of these companies was done in secret with the promise of increased profits after the fall of the United Nations government. So it was, the SV-51 became the cornerstone of the anti-United Nations forces plans to topple the actual United Nations government and, of course, the first variable fighter to actually see full-blown combat. In September of 2008, the SV-51 entered active service within the AUN and its first major operation was to recover an alien artifact that had been discovered by the UNG on the island of Mayan in the South Pacific Ocean. Ace pilots Nora Plonsky and D.D. Ivanov were assigned to the operation piloting their custom-tuned SV-51s into the combat zone and displayed how devastating variable fighters could be against conventional aircraft and even a naval aircraft task force. 
At the time, the United Nations government forces only had F-14A plus Kai Super Tomcats in service using retrofitted over technology avionics and radar systems along with enhanced afterburning turbofan engines. But these fighters proved to be unable to match the ferocity, the speed, and the deadly accuracy and power of the SV-51. And thus, the prototype VF-0s were deployed as a countermeasure. The SV-51 variable fighter has only two different style of models with slight variations between them over the base model. And this was due to the limited access that the anti-United Nations forces had to aircraft manufacturing facilities at the time. The SV-51 Alpha is a single seat variant designed for mass production type with an estimated 32 units along with six converted into two seat variants for training purposes but they were also as combat ready as the standard model. The SV-51 Gamma was specifically configured and had enhanced tuning for veteran ace pilots, but only two of these units were ever confirmed in combat, the ones piloted by Nora and DD Ivanov. They were faster along with increased mobility thanks to their customized tuning, and they were armed slightly better than the Alpha version of that variable fighter. Now, let's take a closer look at the specifications and the performance of the SV-51 series of variable fighters. In fighter mode, the SV-51 has a length of 22.77 meters and in Batroid mode, a height of 14.8 meters, making it higher than the VF-0. I finally managed to get the height for the Jerwalk mode for the VF-0 series, that being 9.1 meters, and the SV-51 is 9.4 meters tall. Width-wise, the VF-0 sits at 8.5 to 14.9 meters depending on swing wing position, and the SV-51 sits at 13.4 meters wide. The head unit has a high-definition TV camera, night vision camera, infrared laser designator, laser rangefinder, IFF data link system, and ultrasonic motion sensor, just the same as the VF-0, reflecting the nature of the stolen design technology. A unique aspect though to the head of the SV-51 is that it can actually extend like a periscope, so while the craft is hovering in jerwalk mode, it can hide behind terrain while monitoring enemy movement. Because of the flexibility of the long arms on the SV-51, it can actually raise its arm up with the gun pod and fire from cover as well. There's also a cropped topped armored shield in the visor that can be deployed to protect the main camera during close quarter combat. The SV-51 is powered by overtuned conventional engines just like the VF-0 since the technology for the more powerful thermonuclear reaction engines was still not ready for production. Those engines are two Avogadro D-30FX-6 conventional turbofan jet engines overtuned to generate thrust 10% over the output of the Sukhoi Su-37's d 30F6 engines and made from over technology super heat resistant ultra lightweight space alloys. The SV-51 has a maximum top speed of Mach 2.81 which exceeds the maximum speeds of both the VF-0A and the VF-0S allowing for it to engage and retreat from combat easily. The SV-51 also has two VTOL high thrust fan jets operating a supplementary lift fans or high maneuverability jets arranged on the back of the fighter in Batroid mode. They are set at the center of the fuselage in fighter mode. This allows the SV-51 to actually take off vertically in its fighter mode, something that the VF-0 can't do in its own fighter mode and something that many other Macross Valkyries cannot do once again, the engines that the SV-51 uses are conventional, so that means they do use conventional fuel, and because of the larger airframe of the SV-51, it has less operational range than the VF-0 variable fighters, so they are deployed from a specially designed submarine carrier. The SV-51s have been modified for underwater launching capabilities using rocket motor attachments, 
and they are deployed light submarine launched ICBMs to help conserve on cruise range for them. Once airborne, the aircraft switch over to, of course, their own conventional engines and the recovery is done with the fighters landing on the surface submarine, easily completed thanks to their VTOL capability. Each of the SV-51s have been modified with improved waterproofing, pressure resistance, and with the unique folding wing construction, so that makes it easier for them to be stored in the limited space aboard the submarine carrier. The SV-51 series has the same ability to transform into two alternate modes, Batroid and Jerwalk mode, which we discussed earlier in the uh, first video of this series. And it is once again more of just an add-on feature for the SV-51. It is highly maneuverable in all modes and the Batroid mode is actually slightly superior to the VF-0 due to the VTOL engines. The SV-51 has relatively underpowered transforming actuators though and this means that the time for transformation between, mo between modes is noticeably longer than the VF-0. The time transforming between modes has been des designated as an important weakness in the Variable Fighter series overall, as transforming under enemy fire is a common occurrence because of the fluidity of the combat that they engage in, going from air to air to air to ground combat quickly. It has multi-axis 90 degree thrust vectoring built into the unique three-pronged feet that also serve as exhaust nozzles for the main engines. Mounted on the SV-51 are top and bottom vertical tails and canard wings, with a pair also located behind the cockpit that can function as both air brakes along with helping to maintain control during high-speed maneuvers. The wings have a unique reinforced folding structure allowing them to be deployed even in Batroid mode and it allows for a greater degree of mobility despite the drag it creates and this is because of a specialized control system. A four channel analog fly-by-wire SDU-29 electric remote control system is subordinated by an SAU-29 CNI airframe system flight control the extension and retract retraction of the folding wings in combination with the rest of the flight surfaces allowed the SV-51 to have an extremely high level of mobility in both Jerwalk and even Batroid modes. To help maintain as much stealth as possible, the SV-51 is equipped with a SP-0-15C 360 degree passive radar warning receiver system for detecting active threat search radars. This works hand in hand with the RP-51 active stealth system and for countermeasures it has an APP-60 chaff and flare dispenser system. For added defense, the SV-51 series also has the Pilfer technology for the energy converting armor system equal to the same power capacity for the VF-0 due to the larger size requiring more power and of course the more powerful engines in the fighter just can't compensate for this. So while it has more powerful engines than the VF-0, unfortunately because of the larger body mass that the energy converting armor has to cover, it's basically relegated to being the same weight class as the VF-0s. Now, let's take a look at the weapons for the SV-51 series and what it carries in the battle, starting with the GSH-231 12.7mm minigun designed for anti-personnel and, of course, anti-light vehicle engagements. In fighter mode, this weapon is located just above the intake and in Batroid mode, it is fixed to the chest. The downside of this design is that it cannot swivel to engage in anti-missile combat easily like the Mahler lasers mounted on the head of the VF-0 series. In the SV-51 Alpha, there is only one of these gu guns mounted on it, while the Gamma version carries two of them, one mounted on each side. One of the downsides though of this design is that in Batroid mode, the casing for the guns is exposed, making it easy to damage them during combat. The main weapon is the GSH-371 55mm gun pod with 120 rounds of ammunition per clip, a powerful rapid firing auto cannon that actually has a magazine system unlike the VF-0 gun pod that just basically has internal storage 
for its ammo and has to be reloaded via, of course, maintenance crews back at the aircraft carrier where it's stationed. The SV-51 carries a spare magazine stowed in the special aft gun pod rack for prolonged combat engagements. This is a heavy caliber weapon, then of course the 35mm gun used by the VF-0 series, but because of the larger rounds, it can only carry a total of 240 rounds into combat, with 120 rounds in each magazine, while the VF-0's gun pod carries a total of 550 rounds of ammunition within it. The penetrating power of this weapon was made very clear in several engagements, and it easily blew massive holes into the F-14 plus a Kai Super Tomcat that Shin was piloting at the start of Macross Zero. The SV-51 carries a total of six underwing hardpoints capable of carrying a combination of weaponry depending on mission requirements. It can use a unique micro-missile launcher auxiliary fuel tank composite pods armed with 18 Tuparov SA-19M IR guided micro-missiles. Designed for short-range engagements against high maneuverability targets, the individual missiles might have lighter warheads, but their ability to strike a target with multiple missiles guarantees that a target will be destroyed. These weapons made short work of the other pilots that were flying against the SV-51s at the beginning of Macross Zero. And of course, you can see that due to their high speed and maneuverability, they are very difficult to evade. For medium range combat, the SV-51 can be equipped with R-33D Amos medium range missiles, with a single of these larger missiles being mounted per hardpoint and it can also be used against surface targets as seen in the attack against a UN fleet. They carry a heavy warhead equal to those used by anti-ship missiles, but with the speed, range, and maneuverability of medium-range missiles, making them able to take down heavily armored targets. One of the most devastating weapons carried by the SV-51 series is an air blast bomb nicknamed the Daisy Cutter. <laughs> These highly controversial weapons use a specialized concentrated mix of explosive liquids to create a massive subnuclear explosion that can kill through explosion and the extreme air pressure impact it creates. The anti-United Nations forces intended on using these weapons on Mayan Island to clear out both the UN forces and the local population to gain an advantage in recovering the alien artifact from the island. The SV-51 was deployed in a booster-equipped variant during the final engagements over the island with two composite engine jet boosters for increased speed and acceleration. The composite Killmoff RD-35AR jet booster engines combined with a turbofan jet engine and ramjet options within one housing allowed the pilot to select the amount of added propulsion that they needed at the time. In an unorthodox design choice, the two boosters are actually installed on overwing hardpoints, allowing the SV-51 booster version to still utilize all six underwing hardpoints for mission-specific loadouts. With the equipped composite jet engine boosters, the SV-51 can achieve a speed of Mach 3.22, allowing for the fighter to reach specific engagement zones quickly, but even with the added fuel tanks, this shortens the operational range of the SV-51 and is one of the main reasons for them being deployed via a submarine carrier. In the end, the SV-51 turned out to be a successful variable fighter, but due to their limited numbers and the abundance of access to overt technology and resources on the United Nations government side, the anti-United Nations forces would ultimately be defeated. Eventually, the SV-51 information and some of the leftover models hidden by the anti-United Nation forces were recovered by UN Spacey at a later date and updated with thermonuclear engines, converted to, of course, the newer model, the SV-52. 
It was as lethal as the most advanced tactical fighter and with its variable modes, able to easily engage a wide range of targets like an advanced multi-role fighter. And with pilots like Nora Polanski and DD Ivanov at the controls, the SV-51 racked up an incredible amount of kills during its operational time. Needless to say, the United Nations government learned how powerful a weapons platform the variable fighters could be and used the, com used the combined combat data and information gathered from the battles against the SV-51 to improve the variable fighters that would emerge to take over for the VF-0. So, next time on the Macross Variable Fighter Lore series, we will be looking at the most recognized variable fighter in all of Macross, the VF-1 series. The VF-1 Valkyries will be divided up into several videos because there are just so many different variations of the VF-1 and I want to talk about them all. So look forward to seeing a video about your favorite version of the VF-1 and hearing every technical detail I can dig up about it. If you love Macross Valkyries, let me know below in the comments which are your favorites and the ones that you can't wait for me to do a video on. Also make sure to like, favorite, and share this video with their friends if they are Macross fans or you want to introduce them into Macross Variable Fighters. Also, look forward to the next episode of the Macross Lore series for Super Dimensional Fortress Macross. If you want to be notified when my next Macross videos drop, subscribe along with hitting that bell icon to be notified when the next episodes come out. Once again, this is Lucian G. Kaiser from the G. Kaiser Age. I want to thank you all for joining me here, and I'll see you next time. Signing out until the next Macross Variable Fighter Lore Battle.